Hello, my name is Michael Levy. I'm a co-director of the PASS course, and I'd like to welcome everybody to the How to Write a Comp session. In this session, we'll be focusing specifically on day two of the CP, which is the role comp. My goal is actually twofold. Number one, I'd like to provide everybody with a good description of what this comp looks like so people have an understanding of what they're up against. And then I'd like to provide a very structured approach for attacking the comp. This comp is a very long case, as you'll see in a moment, and without structure, it's very easy to get lost. So I believe very strongly that you need a very structured approach, and I will provide such an approach to you after I describe the comp. Let's start with our description of the comp. On this comp, there are four possible roles you can be asked to play. Assurance, finance, tax, and performance management. Now, if all you're interested in is getting your CPA, and you're not planning to go into public account accounting, it really doesn't make a huge difference which role you choose. Choose the role where you think you have the greatest chance of success. Choose the area you're most comfortable with. However, if you're interested in your public accountant's license, then you don't really have a choice. You have to choose the assurance role. You would choose your role well before you write the CP. You would have to let CPA Canada know what role you're playing before you even write your CP. The case is divided up between two areas. There is common information in the role comp that everybody needs to address, regardless of their role. And then there's role information, which is specific to each role. So this is in additional information that would be provided for each of the four roles. I think it goes without saying that you would only read the information for your own role. So everybody would read the common information. And then on top of that, if I'm doing assurance, I would read the additional information for the assurance role. If the person sitting next to me has chosen the finance role, that individual would read the common information plus the finance information. Obviously, do not read the additional information for a role you've not chosen. The typical format of the case is as follows. The case is very long. It can be as much as 35 to 45 pages. But the good news is you're not reading every page. Remember, you're only reading the information that's common to everybody and that relates specifically to your role. So despite the length of the case being 35 to 45 pages, you may only be reading somewhere between about 14 to 19 pages. Now, again, that's still quite a few pages, which is why you need a structured approach, but there's a big difference between 14 to 19 pages and 35 to 45 pages. The way in which the case is structured is as follows. It starts typically with a one page index that sets out the exhibits and gives you the page number for each exhibit. There's not very much that you would actually do with that index. Then you've got the first real page of the exam, so to speak, and that's the common background information. Here they would be giving you in one to two pages some common background information about the case, about the company involved in the case, that will be important for all four roles. So everybody would read the common background information. Following the common background information, you would then be provided with the requireds. Now, on this comp, most of the requireds, almost all of the requireds are very explicit, and they're provided by role. So after the common information, you'll see the requireds for each of the four roles. Obviously, you'll only read the requireds that relate to your role. So there are going to be a number of pages you're going to skip here. Typically, the requires will take up somewhere between one to 1.5 pages. There are going to be multiple requires, which is why it can be as long as one to 1.5 pages just describing the requires. Now, following the requires, there will then be some common appendices that everybody has to read, and it can vary tremendously from exam to exam. It can be anywhere from two to seven appendices. The variance probably looks larger than it really is, because keep in mind, uh, you can have seven short appendices and then you can have two appendices, but each appendix is quite long. So at the end of the day, the variance isn't as large as it looks, but there'll typically be some common appendices that are going to be relevant regardless of the role that you play. And then following the common appendices, there'll then be an additional information package for each role. There'll be a final appendix for each of the four roles. So there'll be a final appendix that will be for assurance, another one for finance, another one for tax, and another one for performance management. Once again, only read the appendix that relates to your role. I think that goes without saying. The case will consist 
of either financial reporting or management accounting or both, which everybody needs to address. And then the remaining requires will relate to your role. So at the end of the day, everybody's, everybody's addressing requires in either financial reporting or management accounting or both. And then all of the other requires are completely rule dependent. Now, I'm going to refer to financial and or management accounting as the common competency, because that's the competency that everybody needs to address. If you're interested in history, there's been a CP since September 2015. From September 015, May 016, September 016, as well as September 018, the only common competency tested was financial reporting. There was no management accounting. In September 2017, there was financial reporting as well as management accounting. What has not occurred yet is a comp in which the only common required was management accounting. That has not happened yet. So please understand, everybody will be dealing with the requires relating to financial reporting and or management accounting. Now, there can be a number of assessment opportunities in the common required. Typically, there are approximately five to six AOs for the common competency or competencies. That's been the historic case. At the end of the day, let's say, for example, you've got both financial and management, as was the case in 017, those five to six AOs would include both management as well as financial accounting. In the other years, there would have been five to six AOs strictly dealing with financial reporting. Now, for financial reporting, each AO, each, each assessment opportunity, um, will basically cover a separate accounting issue. So if I've got four accounting issues, I will have four separate AOs. There may also very well be an AO for pulling all the adjustments together and adjusting the financial statements. So it'll be very, very important, as you can imagine, to address each accounting issue. If you leave out even one accounting issue, you will lose a complete AO. Now, what about for the role required? These are the required that are specific to your role, in insurance, finance, et cetera. You can expect seven or eight AOs for the role required, depending on your role. So the number of requires will not necessarily be identical for each role, but typically we're talking about seven to eight requires relating to your role. So most of the requires you're going to be dealing with will be role related. Now, in the common information that you read at the very beginning of the case, this common information I referred to right here, in this common information, don't expect explicit requires. What you're basically being given in this exhibit right here that everybody's reading is background information that will be useful to you in dealing with the requires, but not actual requires. All of the explicit requires will be in the role pages following the common information. So at the end of the day, all of the explicit requires will be right here. After you read the common information, you'll see a heading for each of the roles. Underneath that heading, they will give you the requires for that specific role. So all of the requires are together on comp. They're not going to be all over the case. There may also be an enabling AO, for example, in which you need to deal with a big picture issue to which you're not specifically directed. So almost all of the requires will be very explicit. You'll be told exactly what to do, and they'll relate to financial accounting and or management accounting, plus whatever competency you chose as your role. But there can be, in addition to that, a big picture AO if there's a major issue facing the company, which everybody needs to deal with, which will be labeled as an enabling required. Expect fewer quants in assurance simply because assurance lends itself much less to number crunching. If you stop and think about it, where can you have number crunching in assurance? In assurance, you might have to calculate materiality, but that's a pretty small number cruncher. You may need to do some analytic review, but assurance, just by its very nature, is primarily qualitative. Now, what about for financial reporting, which everybody's addressing? You can almost certainly expect to find numbers there. However, you'll have even more number crunching if there's management accounting on the comp. So at the end of the day, if you've chosen assurance as your assessment opportunity, not a huge amount of number crunching for assurance, but for financial reporting and or management accounting, which also has to crop up on the exam, there definitely will be more number crunch. There definitely will be number crunching. However, the number crunching will be even heavier if it's management accounting versus financial reporting. 
Now, what about if you've chosen another role? Well, as you could probably guess, finance lends itself to a lot of number crunching. Performance management lends itself to a lot of number crunching. Even tax has more number crunching than assurance. For, given that, for example, quite likely you'll have to do various tax calculations. So at the end of the day, the other three competencies other than assurance typically have more number crunching. Now, the requires in each of the roles can vary quite a bit from year to year. The one area though where I find there tends to be a fair amount of repetition is in assurance. In assurance, what you're going to find is that typically there are a number of requires that come up all, almost all the time. So for example, in almost every exam, or pretty, I shouldn't even say almost, I think I would be safe in saying in every exam, you can expect to deal with your classic types of planning issues like risk, materiality, approach, that's almost always asked for explicitly. Then you could be virtually certain you'll be dealing with procedures. Then you may get reporting, so you may have to consider the impact on an audit report. Again, that's certainly not guaranteed. Sometimes there may be special reporting, and at the end of the day, if the special reporting comes up, you'd have to be comfortable with special reporting whether you're dealing with the planning aspect of it, the procedure aspect of it, or the reporting aspect of it. You may, for example, also have to critique controls and identify weaknesses. So at the end of the day, there are a number of requires that you can almost anticipate on the comp because there are a limited number of things you can test on a comp. So as a result of that, it's pretty easy to predict a number of the things that are going to come up. And then there are other things that don't come up every year, but come up quite a bit. However, the one thing about the comp that is not the same every year is the following. In addition to the typical requires that you see on this page, what you're going to find is that they'll frequently throw in an additional required literally out of left field. It may be an obscure section of the handbook. So for example, they may ask you to deal with an IPO or use of an audit expert. If they give you an obscure section, how do I deal with it? So what I always like to tell my students is the following. I tell my students that don't sit there and spend a great deal of time studying every obscure section of the handbook because only one of them or two of them may come up on the whole CP. So you could waste a tremendous amount of time. So when it comes to the more obscure sections in assurance, all that's really important is that you be able to quickly identify the relevant handbook section so that you can look it up quickly using surpass, using, it should actually, I apologize, it really should be secure client or surplus, or surplus, so that you can quickly identify it on secure client or surplus, and then follow the appropriate guidance. So at the end of the day, for the more obscure sections, just know where to find them. And when the time comes up, if an obscure issue comes up, you will have enough time to quickly look at that section and apply it. I don't see a great deal of benefit in starting to memorize all the obscure sections of the handbook. Now, for the other requires, unfortunately, they tend to be less repetitive because there's a great deal more that can be tested. So there it's hard for me to say to you, these are the issues that pretty much come up every year. Assurance is unique in that there are a lesser number of issues that they can test. What I would like to do now that we've described what the comp looks like is provide to you a good structured approach for writing the comp so that you don't get all flustered when you're dealing with a wealth of information. Let me start with step one. Step one entails what you would be doing just when you're reading the background information. In other words, the common information at the beginning of the comp and then the role requires. So this step is before you even go, before you even get to the appendices. This is all that you're doing after simply reading the common information that comes up before the requires as well as your requires. While you're reading the common information and the requires, what are you trying to pull out? So what I would be trying to pull out is the following. 
I would be trying to pull out key factors about the company. So you can expect to find some, what I call extraneous information. That's just a synonym for background information. Obviously you'll be underlining some background information. So key factors and background information I would be underlying typically in the actual case itself and making little notes in the outline, little notes in the margin. So as I'm reading through the common information, the very beginning of the case, I'm underlining what I think are key background pieces of information. I may make little notes in my margin. All of the other points which I'm about to go through, I would actually put onto an outline. I would have a piece of paper in front of me, or you can do the outline on your computer, whatever you prefer. What I would be doing either on a piece of paper or on my computer is I would be starting an outline. So only the first point I would actually put on the actual exam paper itself by underlining or making notes at the margin. All of the other points I'm doing on a separate piece of paper or on my computer. What I'm pulling out from my outline, whether I do it on a piece of paper or whether I do it on my computer, are the following. I would pull out the required, so I'd put each of the required on a separate piece of paper that is my outline. I would put down what I think what my role is on the outline. Sometimes you'll have an idea of factors or objectives that are important to the client. For example, if I'm playing a performance management role, good chance I'm going to want to tie back to the company's objectives. I may be able to note that from the common information, so I'll want to note that in my outline if it's provided. I might be able to pull out some obvious risks just from reading the common information and the requires. It may become obvious that there's certain biases or there may be certain issues in the environment that affect my risk. So I may be able to pull out, if I'm doing the assurance role, some risk factors. Risk factors could, of course, also be relevant if I'm playing a performance management role. So this is something else I would put down on my client, on my outline, factors or objectives important to my client and risk factors. I'd also start to think about what type of quants I might need to do. You may not know all of the quants you need to know, do just by reading the common information and the requires. But there's a good chance that by the time you've read the common information and the requires, at least you'll know about some of the quants that you need to do. So I would already note that on my outline. Now, why am I already thinking about the quants that I may need to do at this stage? Well, think about it. If you know already, right from the start that you're going to have to do a particular number cruncher. I know already from reading the requires that I'm going to do a projected cash flow. I want to note that right away so I can look for the numbers as I'm going through the appendices. It's very helpful to know what type of number crunching you're doing before you start reading the appendices so you know what information to look for. Finally, on the comp, you may have to make certain decisions. You may have to conclude on certain decisions that the company needs to make. Sometimes, just from reading the common information and the requires, you can already identify all or at least some of the decisions that you're going to need to make. Obviously, you won't be in a position yet to make those decisions, but I would note on my outline what those decisions are. So by the time I finish reading the background information, that common background information on my role requires, I would have all of these points sitting on my outline, whether it's on a separate piece of paper or whether it's on my computer. And then again, my actual case paper itself would be marked up in so far as I would have underlined what I thought were some key factors about the company and possibly made some notes in my margin. Now, this first step should take somewhere from about 10 to 20 minutes. I realized that that sounds like a lot of time because when I showed you how many pages there were, there aren't a huge number of pages for the common information or for the role required. So some of you might be wondering, how do I spend 10 to 20 minutes on step one? The reason I suggest spending 10 to 20 minutes is you want to read the requires extremely carefully, very slowly, because I would look at reading the requires a little bit like setting a foundation for a building. And this is an idea one of my students once said to me, his family was in construction. And he said to me, so he thought about everything in terms of construction. And he actually said to me that I look at step one like laying a foundation for a building. If I don't lay a good foundation, the building will fall down, God forbid. Well, it's the same thing here. If you don't do a good job on step one, and as a result, you miss a required or you misinterpret a required, you could be losing a whole AO, which you certainly want to avoid. So it's worth spending a lot of time on step one. Now, before beginning step two, 
I would take, again, if I'm doing this physically on a piece of paper, I would actually take a piece of paper and I would put down one to two required, more likely a couple of required on each page of my outline. So I would take one piece of paper and I would put down on it required one and required two, and I would leave space between each required. So I might have required one here, then I'd have some space, and then I would put down required two. Then I would take another piece of paper and put down required three and four, again, leaving space. This way, I can insert the various issues that come up under each required, underneath that required. So when issues start to come up that relate to required one, I can put it down here. And when issues come up that relate to required two, I can put it down here. It's a great way to stay organized because you're going to be thrown a tremendous amount of information on this exam, right? It's a five hour exam with a lot of pages. So you need to have a means of tracking the information you're going to need to tie back to in a very organized way. So I would be able, I would slot things directly underneath the required to which it relates. Now, obviously, if I'm doing my outline on a computer, then of course, I would simply put down the requires on my, obviously electronically. Then of course, I don't need to leave space, but I can insert things wherever I like. What I'd like to do now is talk about step two. Step two is what would I be doing as I read the remainder of the case and I complete my outline? So, Keep in mind, guys, after you've read the common information and the role, you still have to read the rest of the case, which is basically the common appendices that relate to every role, as well as the package that relates to your specific role. What I'm going to go through now is what would I be tracking as I read the appendices that are common to everybody, plus the package for my own role. Number one, as I'm reading through the rest of the case, I would try to determine if there are further factors or objectives that are important to the client. I'd also be looking for more risk factors. And again, risk is obviously going to be important when you're dealing with assurance, but it can be equally important in other roles, particularly performance management. For information that relates to my role, what I would be asking myself is the following whether the information is qualitative or quantitative, I'll be asking myself which required or requireds does this information relate to. So I'll be thrown various issues and various case facts and I'll insert them in my outline underneath the appropriate required. As we mentioned earlier, I've typically got a maximum of two requires on each page and I would be inserting the issues or case facts underneath the appropriate required. I also find that it's very helpful to keep notes in the margin of the exam paper. So for example, if I'm reading some of the common appendices that everybody reads and there's a major accounting issue, what I might do is I would obviously take that issue to my outline, but in addition to that, so I would put that issue underneath the accounting required, but in addition to that, I would obviously be underlining key facts on the exam paper, and I'd be making little notes in the margin. So if the facts, for example, relate to transfer, let's say the issue I identified was revenue rec, and the facts relate to transfer of risks and rewards, I might underline those facts on the case paper, I might write in the margin of the paper, risks and reward, and then I would take the information to my outline. So in addition to taking issues and facts to your outline, I'm also underlining and I'm also keeping notes in my margin. Now, you want to avoid writing a whole book for your outline because you don't have time to write a book and then start writing up your case. So you want to keep the level of detail fairly minimal in your outline. The way in which you can keep the level of detail fairly minimal in your outline is by making maximum use of cross-referencing. So what I would be doing is the following. Let's come back to my example of revenue rec. Underneath the accounting required, you wrote down revenue rec as you were reading the common appendices. Now, in the actual paragraphs dealing with revenue rec, what I would do, as I mentioned before, is I would underline key facts, 
and I'd write little notes to remind myself how I'm going to use those facts. So I might write down, as I said before, risks and rewards right next to a particular fact that I underlined that ties back to transfer of risk and rewards. Another case fact may tie back to collectability. So I might underline that fact and write in the margin collectability. By making maximum use of cross-referencing, what I can do is I can track a lot of the key facts on the exam paper itself. And then my outline, I don't have to write a lot. I may, able to be, I may be able to simply write in my outline revenue rec, a large right with this pencil. I may be able to write revenue rec. And then all that I might write in addition to that in my outline is, let's say it was in appendix number two that I identified the revenue rec issue. I might just write down appendix number two. And let's say these various case facts that I'm going to want to tie back to in dealing with revenue rec, we're in paragraphs three and four. I might just write down P3 and four. So I'm not writing a huge amount in my outline. In my outline, I'm writing down the issue. And then I'm simply putting down where the case facts came up for that issue. And then in the paper itself, I'm underlining the case facts and I'm writing little notes at the margin. So when I'm ready to write up revenue rec, I know exactly where to find the case facts. Underlined, there's little notes reminding me of how I want to tie back to revenue rec principles. And I'm laughing. Now, sometimes you can have information on the same issue in more than one place. So if there's further information in revenue rec when I get to appendix four, then I would write next to here, I would put a comma, and then I would write next to here, appendix four, let's say it was in the first paragraphs, paragraphs one and two. So in my outline, I'm, I'm putting down the various issues, but I'm writing a minimal amount because I'm making maximum use of cross-referencing. And then in the paper itself, I'm making a point of underlining and writing little notes in the margin. Now, on the comp, there's a good possibility you're going to have to come to decisions. You're going to have to conclude on certain decisions the company needs to make. I mentioned earlier, you may be able to identify some of the decisions that need to be made already when you're reading the common information and role required. But there may be other decisions that emanate from what you read in the remainder of the case. So you may be able to determine there are additional decisions that need to be made by the time you finish reading the rest of the case. For example, it may become apparent after you've read the common appendices and the package for your role that there's an issue around whether the company has breached a covenant. So you may, deter you may only determine at that stage that I need to make a decision. Did they or did they not breach that covenant? In terms of quants you might have to do, I've given you examples of quants. Because one of the things you're going to be able to determine with certainty by the time you finish reading the common appendices following the role requires, as well as your own package, is by that point, you'll, be, you'll know exactly what quantitative schedules you need to do. While you were reading the requires, you may have identified some of the quants, but there's a good possibility you may identify additional quants you need to do as you're reading through the remainder of the case. So as I'm reading through the common appendices following the role required, plus the package for my role, I will determine with certainty what additional quants I need to do beyond the quants I identified in the role required. All I've done over here is I've given you examples of some of the quants that can come up. This is not intended by any stretch of the imagination to be comprehensive. This is nothing more than examples of the types of quants you may have to do. What I'd like to address now is the final step of the approach, and I can't overstress the importance of this stage. This is a stage that you would go through after you finished reading the exam. So you've now read the exam and you've completed your outline. You've inserted all of the various issues underneath each of the requireds. You've cross-referenced to the various paragraphs in which you need to find the information. You've now got a completed outline. The final step is to do what I'm about to show you now, which you would be doing after your outline is already complete. It's a huge mistake to simply finish your outline and then start writing or start typing. That would be a bad idea. Before you start typing, here's some steps you need to go through. Number one, as you were reading through the case, 
you should have been underlining extraneous information. You may recall that we said in step one that there'll be some extraneous or background information that you picked up in the common information that you would have underlined. Then you might have underlined further extraneous information as you read through the rest of the appendices and your own package. Sometimes you will not know what to do with this background information when it's first given to you. You certainly don't know what to do with this extraneous slash background information that's in the common information that comes up at the very beginning of the case, because at that stage, you don't even know what you're required to do. Also, even in the appendices that follow the requires, they'll sometimes give you extraneous slash background information too early for you to know what to do with it. So what I would do after I finished reading the case is I would go back to any extraneous slash background information. And as long as I think it might relate to my role, I would ask myself, to which required does this relate and try to use the information. The bottom line is not every piece of extraneous information in, for example, the common information at the beginning of the case will relate to your role because everybody's reading it. But some of it likely will. So you'll go back to the extraneous information. If you think it relates to your role, you'll ask yourself, which required or requireds can I use this information for? If I can't use this information for any requireds, then it probably relates to another role. B, I would look at each required and ask myself, which past techniques can I use? Those of you who will be taking the past course, you'll be learning specific techniques for dealing with financial accounting as well as assurance. And you'll want to ask yourself which of the techniques are relevant in this particular case. The most important part of step three is ranking. As you can probably guess, you're not going to want to spend the exact same amount of time on every required. Some requires will take a lot more time than others. And there can be huge variance in terms of the amount of time you spend on one required versus another. So in order to come up with an optimal time allocation, You'll want to rank the requireds. How do you rank the requireds? On what basis do you decide whether to spend a lot of time or minimal time on a particular required? So number one, I would take a look at how much information I have available, and that will often drive the amount of work I can do. If I've got a ton of information on a particular issue, then I can probably write quite a bit in order to get depth, and I'll spend more time on that issue. I would also ask myself, Am I dealing purely with qualitative or both qualitative and quantitative? If there's a major quant that's required, I mentioned earlier, let's say finance was your role and you have a big projected cash flow to do or tax is your role. You've got a major tax calculation to do. You know you're going to be spending a lot of time on that required because big quants by their very nature are very time consuming. If it's purely qualitative, then again, it'll come down to how much information do I have to work with? And on that basis, how much do I really need to do? If I've really got to do a lot, then obviously I need to allocate a lot of time. But again, the difference in time allocations can be huge between different requires. You can have a require that you can literally get under your belt in 10 minutes, and then another require that will take you 30 minutes. So I would rank and allocate my time, taking into consideration, the amount of work I need to do for that particular required. I certainly would not arbitrarily allocate. Now, obviously, it goes without saying that as important as it is to come up with a good time allocation, it's equally important to stick to your time allocation. Because at the end of the day, if you don't stick to your time allocation, then you, you may potentially run out of time. And there's no way in the world that you can afford to leave out any requires. I mentioned at the very beginning of the class that there'll be at least one AO relating to each required. And for financial account and within the required, there'll be a separate AO for each accounting issue. So if you don't stick to your time allocation and therefore you don't have time to complete all the requires, it'll be very, very, very difficult to get through the CP. So as important as it is, come up with a good time allocation, make sure you stick to it. Finally, there's integration. There's a good possibility that the requires can be intertwined, or maybe within a required, the issues can be intertwined. Always ask yourself, how are the requires and or issues intertwined before you start writing? 
because if required A impacts B, very important to do A before B. If B impacts A, you'll want to do B before A. It'll have a huge impact on the sequence in which you attack the case. Now, the total approximate time spent for planning, and I'm now including everything, all, all steps, steps one, two, and three, probably about 90 minutes. Now, some comps are shorter than others. If it's a shorter comp, then you might be able to do all three steps in, let's say, 70 minutes. But I would say on average, and again, it depends on the length of the comp. It also depends on the individual student. On average, I'm saying about 90 minutes planning and the remaining 210 minutes to actually write the case. I'll just end with just a few points to think about as you're actually writing the case. When it comes time to write the case, you may find yourself going back and rereading some parts of the case. As I mentioned earlier, you might only write down on your outline, revenue rec, appendix two, paragraphs three and four. Obviously, when it comes time to write up revenue rec, you'll reread that part of the case. You may also find yourself rereading parts of the case because, for example, uh, you only have a couple of risk points on sitting on your outline, and you know there are likely to be more. So what you may end up doing is going back and just quickly skimming through the case to pull out more risk points. As far as the quants go, it's really a matter of personal preference. Some people like to do all the quantitative exhibits first. Some people will do the quantitative exhibits as they're going along. So as they're dealing with a particular required, they'll do the quants with that required. So it's two different approaches. Some people will say, you know what, I'll get all my quants done and then I'll move back and do my qualitative. Others do it as they go along. There is no right or wrong approach. Make sure to watch your time. I was saying earlier, very important not to go beyond the time you've allotted to a particular required. But the only way to, to do that successfully is to watch your time. Say I've allotted 30 minutes to a required. I can't look at my watch for the first time after 25 minutes have passed. Because at that point in time, if I've only gotten through half of what I needed to do, it's too late to make adjustments. But if I look at my watch quite regularly, then I might, for example, after 15 minutes realize I've only done a quarter of what I need to do. At that point, I can make adjustments and say, I've only got 15 minutes left and I've got three quarters left to do. Let me prioritize what really needs to get done. I'm not going to do everything I plan to do, but I'll get the essential stuff done in the next 15 minutes. So as long as you watch your time, you can always make adjustments and then you can feel comfortable by the time your time is up that at least you've dealt with what you think are the essential points. Try to keep things simple. If you make things more complicated than necessary, you could end up wasting more time. Don't do a more complex number cruncher than was absolutely necessary. When you're trying to explain something, don't try to be fancy. Just explain it in the simplest, quickest terms possible. There's no need to reread the whole case. There isn't enough time to reread the whole case. As long as you've done a decent reading the first time, yes, you'll go back to parts of the case, as we said earlier, but no need to read the whole case. And then finally, this is true for any exam you write. I'm sure you remember this already from the university. Watch out for late changes. So it's a psychological thing here. Sometimes people at the last minute will go back and make all sorts of changes to their appendices or changes to their qualitative. Very often that doesn't enhance the case. So I would be very, very careful about that. This completes the how to write a comp session. I hope you found the session useful.